Welcome to the Modern Athenas podcast with Sonia and Debbie, where we discuss how regular women became Athenas in their own time by working hard, persevering through the challenges in their lives, and contributing to a better world. This is podcast 27. In this podcast, we will be discussing the book An Improbable Friendship by Anthony David. You can use the link on our website at modernathenas.com to order the book after the podcast. Friendships can happen in the most unlikely of places, in the most unlikely of times. Like romance, it is hard to predict who our friends will be and even harder to ignore forces that make a friendship blossom. Such is the case of Ruth Diane, an Israeli Jew, and Ramona Tawel, a Palestinian Christian. If you asked either of the women if they thought when they first met after the Six Days War in 1967 that they would be lifelong friends, both would laugh and then make a dig at each other's culture and politics while professing their admiration for each other. That is their friendship. Born out of conflict and forged through decades of turmoil and heartbreak, the two women have a deeply rooted respect and love for each other that transcends borders, religion, and nationalism. Each of them a power broker in a male-dominated society, the intertwined stories are ones of strength and determination. These modern Athenas demonstrate that no matter a woman's identity, we all want to create meaning and purpose for ourselves in our world. Overview of the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict the area that resides between the southern Lebanese border, the western Syrian and Jordanian borders, and the Egyptian northeastern border has been called many different things since biblical times. Today, it is most often referred to as Israel and the occupied territories. Nomenclature aside, the small area of land has been and continues to be the site of conflict between Jews, Christians, and Muslims, who argue that each of them has a right to the land that holds each of their most sacred sites. After World War I, Jews steadily migrated to the area, causing tension with the extensive Arab population that was already living there. The migration became more of a flood during World War II as Hitler moved through Europe, exterminating the Jews. Israel was established in 1948, and during the 1948 to 1949 Arab-Israeli War, Arabs living in cities now controlled by Israel were forced out. Since then, the ongoing Arab-Israeli conflict has left thousands dead, families separated, and enough distrust and blame between the two sides to out to last the world over. It isn't that the two sides don't communicate. Summits with prominent world leaders, special envoys, secret conferences, protests, bombing, walls, wars, UN resolutions, assassinations, election, terrorist organizations, refugee camps, restrictions, rockets, they communicate. Perhaps it's more accurate to say that after nearly 70 years, they do not communicate in the language of peace. It does now appear that moderates on both sides believe that a two-state solution could be possible, they are being drowned out by the extremists. The right-leaning parties in Israel denounced the two-state solution and pushed forward building more Jewish settlements on the richest lands in the West Bank and Gaza, excluding and agitating the Arabs, and Hamas, a known terrorist organization and the de facto leader in Gaza, launches suicide bombers and rockets into Israel with the sole purpose of blowing up as many Israelis as possible. It is against this backdrop that Ruth and Raymonda began and have maintained their friendship for 50 years. Accordingly, we start by providing you with a brief overview of their individual stories before focusing on their friendship. Ruth Diane. Ruth was born in Haifa before the end of World War I, when the Holy Land was still under Turkish rule. Ruth gave up a comfortable middle-class life to marry Moshe Dayan, a, a farmer, in 1935. They enjoyed their simple but hard farm life for years until Moshe joined the fledgling Israeli Home Defense Force. He began being away from home, and by the time the State of Israel was created in 1948, he had risen through the ranks and commanded the Jerusalem front of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. He was later chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces from 1953 to 1958, including during the 1956 Suez Crisis and then defense minister during the Six-Day War in 1967 and the Yom Kippur War in 1973. He eventually changed political parties and played an important role in the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. Moshe was, for all intents and purposes, Israel's military hero during the first decades of statehood. But Ruth's home life was in constant turmoil. She and Moshe had three children, a daughter, Yael, who is a successful novelist and leftist politician, a son, Asi, who is a successful actor and movie director, and another son, Ehud, who is also a writer. As the children were growing up, their loyalties were divided between their parents, who mostly led separate lives. By 1971, after years of Moshi's infidelity, Ruth asked for a divorce. She did not seem to feel victimized. Rather, she felt that it was time for her to move on. Ruth never remarried. 
Throughout his career, Moshe knew and worked with many of the now famous Israeli politicians, including David Ben-Gurion, the primary founder of the State of Israel, and the first Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, Simon Perez, Ariel Sharon, and Menachem Begin, founder of the Likud Party. Back when Mish Moshe and Ruth first knew them, they were the fighters of the young state of Israel and often gathered in the Dayan house to talk strategy and politics. As they grew more important, they began to drift apart, each on their own trajectory. But Ruth maintained contact with each of them and continued to build her network of Israeli power brokers. Ruth's younger sister married a fighter pilot, Ezer Weizmann, who rose to become Israel's seventh president. Ruth's contact list eventually included anyone who was anyone in Israeli public life. Without a farm to focus on after Moshe joined the military, Ruth became, became a humanitarian, creating the first female-owned government company, Masket, that acted as financial lifeline for immigrant women in Israel and Palestinian women in the occupied territories. The women created ethnic crafts and handiwork that Ruth then sold and divided up amongst the women. At one point, Masket was low on funds and struggling to survive. Ruth used her power broker network and a connection with the mayor of Jerusalem to set up a meeting with buyers in New York. Although her first two meetings were unsuccessful, she eventually got an appointment with the buyer for Berghoff Goodman and made $16 million worth of Israeli bonds at, at one fashion show. Ruth continued her work expanding to the West Bank and Gaza even as conflict increased and stability declined. In addition to her work with Masket, Ruth also provided humanitarian support to Palestinians and traveled abroad, including to the Congo, South Africa, and Vietnam. It was this humanitarian work that brought Ruth and Ramonda together. So now we've been introduced to Moshi, the kind of quiet and steadfast soldier, and Ruth, who was an assertive networking humanitarian. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's interesting because Ruth and Moshi, they were, you know, in love very early on. And then Moshi's this, I don't know if he was, he was quiet, but he was definitely this military hero. And he was kind of on his own power broker trajectory. And, you know, early on when they were together, it, it was they were these power brokers together. And then, you know, as these young adults, you know, went through and, and grew up and in their 30s and 40s, and, and they were all excited for this young statehood. And, you know, everybody kind of started on their own ways forward and and you know even he and Ruth sort of started to separate and as they did that you know she built this amazing life for herself and, and her humanitarian work and even after she and Moshi separated she had this whole almost just her own life that, that this career for herself and this is you know how she'll meet Ramonda but um, throughout the book that this humanitarian work kind of threads and it was I was kind of struck by this idea that, you know, she had this whole life that was separate from her husband. And, you know, we, we hear so much about women's lives being intertwined with their husbands, but here's Ruth, who's independent and fierce. Raymond and Towel. Ramona had traveled a much different road than Ruth. She was born during the early years of World War II to a Palestinian Christian family in the ancient coastal city of Acre at the northern extremity of Haifa Bay, back when Palestine was still governed by Britain. Ramonda's mother and father divorced when she was seven, and Ramonda and her brothers were taken from her mother. Ramonda was sent to a convent in Nazareth. It would be years before she found out that her mother was still alive. She would rekindle a relationship with her mother that would last until Ramonda departed for Jordan. As part of the 1947 UN partition plan for Palestine, Acre was designated as part of the Arab state. But during the 1948 war, Acre was besieged by Israelis, and on May 17, 1948, it was captured by Israel, displacing three-quarters of the Arab population. Ramona's affluent family lost their home, and they were never able to return. In 1957, Ramona left Israel at the behest of her father to go to Amman to join her brothers. But the decision would have life-changing implications. Once she passed through the Mandelbaum Gate between Israel and Jordanian Jerusalem, she could never return, quote. By crossing the border, she would never again wander the valleys of the Galilee with her mother. Never again would she see her Jewish friends in Haifa. She might as well have stepped into a rocket ship with no way back to Earth. End quote. The Israeli officer led her across the border, permitting her one last tearful hug with her mother. He handed her off to his Jordanian colleague at the border station. Quote. She paused for a moment. It was as if she were at the edge of a cliff, bending over to see the bottom and seeing nothing. Her heart was racing, unsure whether she should continue, but it was too late. The Israeli border authorities held her passport, and they wouldn't give it back, even if she begged and implored. 
end quote. Quote, who was she? A Jordanian? Never. A Palestinian? Yes. But what was Palestine but lines on an old map? Was she an Israeli? Yes and no. She no longer had citizenship in the country, even if by sensibly she was a product of the mongrel Jewish Arab, Hebrew Arabic culture of Haifa and Acre. Her only links to the country were Israeli radio broadcasts and reports from the rare travelers crossing the fortified borders. End quote. In Amman, Jordan, her brothers frowned on her spirit and independence and insisted that she be a traditional Arab wife. She married Daoud Tawil when she was 18, and they eventually settled in Nablus. But Raimonda refused to become a traditional Arab wife. She became the driving force for the Arab Women's Union, a Nablus-based feminist organization. Her home soon began a ga became a gathering point for Western ambassadors and diplomats. At the end of the Six Days War in 1967, Raimonda's political activities increased. She eventually moved her family to Ramallah. Her home became the center of political activity and a key source of information for the foreign press. In 1976, the Israelis placed her on three months house arrest. Raimonda says it was because she helped with the Israeli peace movement. At the same time, Raimonda was looked at with disdain by the Arab community because of her activism work. In the mid-1980s, Raimonda fled Ramallah to Paris after there were threats to her life and her car exploded. Raimonda introduced her daughter, Suha, to Yasser Arafat. Raimonda admired Arafat as a leader, a fighter, and an ideologue. She thought her daughter could take part in political activities and assist him with the organization of public relations. Sue and Arafat married in 1990 to the irritation of her parents and his top advisors. Raimonda, through her daughter, had privileged access to Yasser Arafat and the PLO High Command. After her husband died in 1995, Raimonda returned to Ramallah, which by then was the capital of the Palestinian Authority, and visited Arafat often. After Arafat's death in 2004, she left for good, vowing not to return until there is peace. She went into exile, eventually settling with Sue and her granddaughter in Malta. So, unlike Ruth, Raimonda's story is, you know, somewhat more tragic. So she was really born in where what's now, you know, Israel and and this an Acre. But when she left, once it was sort of was part of the Arab state, but wasn't. Um, and when she passed through Israel for the last time and into Jordan, you know, she, it was a one-way trip. She was not able to go back. And then she was in this Arab world, but she didn't want to be this traditional Arab wife. And she was sort of forced into this position, into this new culture and world she didn't want to be in. And you can kind of hear that she kind of bucked traditional society um, and she bucked it and obviously a little hard. Um, and, you know, she suffered for that. And, um, you, but you can hear this independent spirit of hers. And you, again, you heard it a little bit with Ruth and together, these two independent spirits, that's what's going to bring these two um, to, to create this friendship. Yeah, I thought it was kind of really neat to watch how these two women who have these different lives, they, they how they get kind of thrown onto this world stage, even though it's still kind of in the behind the scenes. And I, I found it just fascinating to see how that part unfolded. But Ramonda's life really was filled with adversity and conflict. And somehow she still found uh, and identified the opportunities along the way. But, uh, you know, she's really struggling with her identity, it seems. And uh, and maybe this independence is a way to kind of claim that back. 1967, their paths cross for the first time. The Six-Day War took place in June 1967. Israel, led by Moshe, had great military success, seizing control of the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Jordan, and the Golan Heights from Syria. Later, Israel would withdraw from the Sinai, Egypt would withdraw its claim of sovereignty over Gaza, and Jordan would withdraw its claim of sovereignty over the West Bank. The Six-Day War made Moshe an Israeli national hero, though after the war he was hated by the Palestinians for his military ruthlessness and iron fist in his handling of the occupied territories. After the war, the Shin Bet, Israel's equivalent to the FBI, arrested five girls from bourgeois families in the West Bank on suspicion of terrorism. Moshe ordered that their old family mansions be blown up. Ramonda fired off a telegram to Moshe. The Israeli military governor of Nobulus, General Givoli, berated her for the telegram and noted, quote, My dear Ramonda, let me offer you a friendly piece of advice. You are not a little girl in Haifa and you are no longer an Israeli citizen. 
Israel is a democracy, true, but in case you haven't noticed, what we have in the West Bank, my dear lady, what we have here is not a democracy. It's a military occupation. Shall I spell it out for you? O-C-C-U-P-A-T-I-O-N. Unless you understand the difference, I foresee some big problems for you up ahead. End quote. At Romonda's urging, General Givoli began sitting for hours with the five girls in prison, trying to find out what motivated them. It didn't take long for him to see that their idealism was similar to his when he fought the British. He worried about their health and thought they would waste away if they had nothing to do. Quote, Gavoli thought about Ruth and Masket. Perhaps his boss's wife could teach the girls a craft. He knew Ruth would use every opportunity to hop in her sob and return to the landscape of her youth. Just as he suspected, Ruth jumped at the idea. Her plan was to deliver toys on behalf of Abby Nathan to wounded children, collateral damage during an IDF operation at St. Luke's Hospital in Nobulus, before continuing on to the prison. End quote. Ramonda was at St. Luke's the afternoon that Ruth arrived. She was dealing with refugees, the dead and the dying. She saw Ruth move through the ward. When Ruth was close enough, Ramonda started speaking in Hebrew. She had learned in her childhood in Haifa to let Ruth have a piece of her mind. Quote, Since hearing radio reports of the massacres in the 1950s, Moshe Dayan had been for her an evil cyclops. She struck back at his wife. How dare you come in here pretending to care for the children? Do you know what your husband is doing to us? Ruth admired the Amazon spunk, but waved off the charges. I don't believe we've met, she began, holding a Barbie in her hand. But you should know, she was shaking the doll in Ramonda's direction, the glass eyes blinking with each movement of her arm. I married a farmer and not a general. Don't blame me for all of this, this horror... Ramonda watched as tears formed in Ruth's eyes. Her jaws were clenched. She handed Ruth a tissue but stuck to her guns. Well, this farmer boy of yours is making our lives hell. Your husband is giving orders to shoot children and you bring toys. Get out of Palestine. For God's sake, I am not Moshi Dayan. End quote. It was a phrase that Ruth would repeat to Ramonda, Ramonda many times during their friendship. In the following years, whenever, whenever Ruth was passing through Nobulus and the West Bank for Masket business, she dropped by at Ramonda's, where activists, foreign reporters, mothers with pictures of their children who had been swallowed up by Israeli prisons, and feminists all gathered in her living room. Ruth developed a deep fondness for Ramonda's husband, Dayud. So now we see how these two women's live inter lives intersected through conflict and and they were both well established in their roles by this time. But, you know, there's kind of that poignant moment where it says that Ramonda hands Ruth uh, a tissue kind of in the midst of this, this encounter in this um, uh, confrontation uh, that kind of sparks this really kind of complex friendship that they have. I I love this moment. I mean, she's holding a Barbie in her hand, right? They've gone, they, they, they've, they've had this war. I mean, this, you've got to understand this region. I mean, it's the the conflict, the layers of conflict, the amount of atrocity and, and death and just destruction. And here these two women are in this hospital arguing with a Barbie doll in hand and yelling at each other. And the fiery spirits of these two women and you'll hear a little more as we as we continue through this podcast but the amount of good that these two women do by leveraging their networks together is is just incredible and but the this first meeting in the hospital I mean it's just it I mean it made me smile it's just it's pretty it was pretty incredible April 1973 Kamal Nasir Raimonda was in Beirut in April 1973 when Ehud Barak, the future Israeli prime minister, masqueraded as a woman arm in arm with her lover, broke into a PLO man's apartment and in front of his wife and children, shot him. He killed Kamal Nasir, a Christian poet Raimonda knew, read, and adored. Quote, After she had gotten word of the killing, she rang up Ruth in Tel Aviv. You know what that husband of yours did? He, he killed, oh my God, he killed my friend. How cowardly to gun people, people in front of their families. Kamal Nasir was the best example of a nationalist choosing peaceful means of resistance. What do you think I can do about it, Raimonda? Ruth had a sharp edge to her voice. You think I'm God and can resurrect him? Raimonda was angling for a public statement, but Ruth demurred. Maybe the dead man really was a terrorist. Ruth wasn't about to defend people planting bombs and firing on Israeli school buses. End quote. 
And so you have this example of what would often happen between Ruth and Raimonda, where there would be some sort of an, an act, either the Israelis or the Palestinians, and the other one would call the other one up and, and sort of go off about what had happened and ask, you know, well, what are you going to do about it? And they'd say, well, I, I don't know what I'm going to do about it. And so there was this sort of awkward tension. And you've got to understand, these are these are two women who are very high sort of level or or highly placed up um, in their respective societies. And so just watching this sort of power balance between them was fascinating. Well, and I really felt that was a, it was a strange symbol of how complex this conflict must still be. But it was like they kind of each had this unusual access to the other side, but at the same time, their friendship was almost like an outlet to express and process what was going around, going on around them. Yeah, and I think that it was the it, it wasn't you know the title of the books an improbable friendship and it and it was but you know you couldn't help but ask yourself I I have a friend who um, I went to college with who lived in Israel for a pretty good period of time I think both of her children were born there but you know I I can't help but ask myself as I was reading this book you know what would happen if there were more open dialogue and you know she's a big proponent of this open dialogue between the two sides but. Um, you know, listening to these two women who were so prominent in both of their societies having this open dialogue for so many years. And though it sounds angry, it's really not. It's this just love of each other. Um, and if, you know, if the two sides could have this this openness rather than this, you know, lobbing bombs back and forth, you just, I don't know, you just wonder. 1974, Ruth travels the world on behalf of Masket and the World Craft Council. In early 1974, Ruth began traveling the world on behalf of Masket and the World Craft Council, a UNESCO-backed organization, quote, Whenever she returned to Israel, Ruth always visited the West Bank to check in on her Palestinian masketeers making rugs and embroidery. The orphans in Bethlehem couldn't wait to see her pull up in her sob. It meant more toys. Her and Raimonda's friendship grew through regular conversations over to Annapolis, Ramallah, or East Jerusalem. The two women had a lot to talk about, women's issues, children, jobs, various permits from the military authorities, and occasionally politics. Raimonda would bring up a list of atrocities she claimed were committed by the IDF, and Ruth would stamp her foot exclaiming, I am not Moshi Dayan, end quote. So even after Ruth divorced Moshi, Raimonda still is blaming Ruth for all of Moshi's, you know, actions. So... I don't know. You know, part of me thinks Ruth was kind of charmed by it all. Um, You know, it was just this is the way that, again, that she and Raimonda kind of spoke to each other and um, kind of expressed their love. Well, at the yeah, like at the foundation of it, there was just this opportunity for these two women to really have kind of a sisterhood. And yet there was this kind of game and strategy and and that they couldn't extract themselves completely from. And uh, so it always kind of kept emerging and like penetrating through this like sisterhood in these uh it's almost it's almost like the end of every op- every conversation it's like the last word always had to be i'm not moshi diane <laughs> so um yeah it was it was it was really kind of a, a fun almost like feeder to watch the tree planting in the peace forest of Nevis shalom quote by 1974, Ruth and Raimonda were a well-known pair, racing around Israel and the West Bank, usually in Raimonda's sleek new Citroen SM. The two were an odd couple. Ruth didn't care about style, while for Raimonda it was always important, both out of the natural p- pride of a francophone and because she was determined to defy the occupier as a beautiful woman. The most public event they did together, with lots of snapping cameras, was a tree planting in the peace forest of Neve Shalom, the Arab Jewish village founded by the Jewish-born Dominican monk Bruno Hussar. At the ceremony, the two friends took their shovels and were ready to start digging a hole for trees when Raimonda spotted an Israeli flag flapping white and blue in the wind. If she were to be shown in an Israeli newspaper with the Star of David in the background, it could spell trouble. She dashed over to the back seat of the Citroen and pulled out a long green and red Palestinian flag she and her daughters had made out of scraps of cloth. She draped the illegal flag, an act punishable by a year in prison, over her shoulders like Superman's cape. Raimonda, take that thing off, Ruth banged her shovel into the dust. Why? Because trees aren't politics, for heaven's sakes. Ruth merely wanted to plant the saplings, smile for the cameras, and call it a day. Raimonda gripped the flag tighter around her shoulders. Yeah, she was thinking, that's convenient for you to be above politics. No one's going to shoot you down for being a collaborator. 
Everything is politics here, Ruth, she finally told her, refusing to back down. Trees, rain clouds, pantyhose, everything. Their eyes locked, and Ramona wondered if their friendship would end over a symbol. She saw a smile forming on Ruth's face. Okay, Ramonda, hang your pantyhose on the flagpole. I have a better idea, Ruth. You plant a tree under your flag, and I'll plant one under mine. It was sort of an impromptu two-state solution, even though Ramonda's real dream was for everyone to live in the same state as equals. Ruth was willing to go along, but the other Israelis now chimed in with indign indignation and catcalls. Even a few pine cones were tossed in Ramonda's direction. The level of hostility rose to such a pitch that the organizers, people of goodwill, hoping for peace, not a lynch mob, called off the event. End quote. You know, and so again, everything is politics, and you know, it was it was dangerous for them to be so close with each other. And you see what happens when other people get involved. It's people questioning motives and, and, you know, it's here are the Israelis and, you know, they're watching this and, you know, it, Ruth and Ramona together, they'd worked it out, right? One stand under one flag, one under the other, there's their two state solution. But more than that, there's their friendship. They work it out. But then you've got these other people, these outsiders coming in and they don't see it the same way. They don't see that friendship. They see it as Palestinian and Israeli. Yeah. For them, they, they had to, they could like, they, they could never divorce themselves from these politics that were around them, but they knew, I think they knew what was still at the root of it and most important, which was their friendship. And they saw each other for, for kind of the position that they each were in. And they, in a way they completely could relate, but then they still had their own position. So it was, this was such a, um, I really liked this, the the fact that they shared this this moment for them this tree planting which just kind of was so symbolic of so many things that they were already going through and um like even here it even said it was kind of this impromptu two-state solution so let's hear a little bit more about that the two-staters Ramondo was placed under house arrest by the israelis for her activist work at first, a steady stream of visitors, including Ruth, would spend time in the Tawil house. Israel eventually forbade visitors. The plan backfired, and they lifted the house arrest when it was clear that the political climate would not support it. Following Ramonda's release from house arrest, activists from all over the world and the West Bank, along with Ruth and a gaggle of other left-wingers, resumed their pilgrimages to the Tawil house. The Israelis were excited about a new political organization that they were forming that they hoped would break the power monopoly of the labor and right-wing parties. Quote, it was the first Zionist group to call openly for two states, one Jewish and one Palestinian, and Ruth's support was considered a coup for the group. Then, as now, Ruth wasn't sure it made such much sense to carve out a separate Palestinian state when it seemed easier and better for everyone to live together as equals. But she was happy to support the leftists, as at least they were doing something." End quote. So again, Ruth and Ramonda, now it's not just symbolic kind of this tension between, but now they're really trying to take steps towards this direction and strategy that they, you know, feel like is, it could be an option. Yeah, and I think that Ramonda always was more p politically active than Ruth. Ruth, but Ruth just wanted, yeah, Ruth just wanted that solution, you know. And Ra Ramonda kind of was like, "Oh, I want it to be this," and Ruth was like, "Whatever is going to work." Secret back channel quote: Ruth often returned to Israel from her humanitarian trips, and Ramonda would give her plenty of hugs and a long list of requests for favors. With Weitzman as her brother-in-law. Ruth could pull strings, and she normally did whatever Ramonda asked. Sometimes without knowing it, Ruth facilitated the work of the PLO, end quote. In New York, Ramonda organized an illegal meeting between Arafat's top representative at the UN and Ruth. Ruth was flying up from South America, quote, Working amid the squalor of third world slums and being far from Israel made Ruth more empathetic to the Palestinian cause and more indifferent to the opinions of grandstanding politicians as well as Israeli law. Sitting on the couch, the representative handed Ruth a personal message from his boss, Arafat, which expressed his willingness to cut a peace deal with the Israeli government on the condition that Israel recognize the PLO and agree to the establishment of the Palestinian state on the frontiers of the armistice of 1949, including East Jerusalem. This was the first time such a formal offer was ever mentioned by a Fatah leader, and Ruth knew it. End quote. Ruth agreed to deliver the message to her brother-in-law at Sir Weissman. 
So now you've got Ruth playing this secret back channel role, which is incredible. I mean, if if I don't know how much our listeners know about this conflict and and the back and forth that's gone on for so many years, but this is incredible um, that 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 Ruth is doing this work and um, you know and and Raymond is organizing it. And ag- again, this just goes to tell you the level of power broker that that both of these women were, and um, you know. I mean, Ruth is taking this letter from Arafat basically and, and passing it on to the, you know, high level in the Israeli government. And um, not only were they trusted to do this, but they were willing to do this. And um, it's empowering to, to watch women, um, you know, do this work. I was reminded of Gertrude Bell back uh, in, in the shaping of Iraq too. And just the kind of so interwoven in this world stage in in kind of like this secret way in a uh it, it was just it was incredible to see how close to just the the heat of the moment they they really were Ramonda also brought up atrocities that she claimed were being made at the hands of Weizmann soldiers Ramonda gave Ruth the address for the mayor in Ramallah and told her to check it out Ruth made a special trip back to Israel and drove to Ramallah The mayor confirmed the atrocities. Appalled, Ruth headed straight for the hospital where Weizmann was recovering from an operation, and she gave him a piece of her mind. Weizmann loved Ruth. After snapping out orders, he quickly flew to Ramallah, talked with the mayor, and heard the same appalling tales. With a sweep of his hand, he asked his officers for confirmation. When none came, which Weizmann assumed was an admission of guilt, he barked out his commands to his underlings to loosen their stranglehold on the Palestinians. On Ruth's next visit to Ramallah, the mayor thanked her for standing on the side of the oppressed. Raimonda began touting Ruth's good witch's power and bringing out Weizmann's humanity. Weizmann began looking to Ruth and Raimonda as a secret conduit to pass information and messages to Arafat. So single-handedly, Raimonda and Ruth begin to reverse Israeli policy in this area in in, in Ramallah. So Raimonda brings up these atrocities that are occurring. She tells Ruth, Ruth then tells this this Weizmann, Weizmann comes out and changes everything that's happening in Ramallah. I mean, it's just incredible. And yeah, it, it's Gertrude, but it's Gertrude at like an entirely almost different level. Um, and so it's, again, they're using their leverage and they're using this, just their wit, their fiery spirits. They're, you know, and they're, they're not out in the forefront. They're not in the political papers. They're not out there making noise. They're just doing this very clever behind the scenes maneuvering. Yeah. And you, I, I think I, I could really feel the momentum of this at this point, like they're swept up into this. They're fully, it feels like they're fully engaged in this, this, you know, intense uh, kind of back and forth and um, these communications and there's, a, they're really swept up in. And I wonder had they ever thought that they would have been in this position. I mean, it's really incredible to, know how close to all of that that they were years later arafat and weizmann were finally able to connect but they spoke directly over a tapped line weizmann didn't know that someone in his organization would distrust him so much in january 1990 word leaked of the call and he lost his job quote if weizmann lost his job at least proved his sincerity to arafat just as ramona had been telling him for years some israelis secretly wanted to come to terms with the palestinians Arafat contacted Ramona and told her that he was now ready for dialogue. He even asked her to set up the meeting with Ruth. Anytime, any place was Ruth's natural response, end quote. Although talks would continue, they never amounted to what the women had hoped for. So here the two women had worked so long and so hard to get these talks going between Arafat and Weizmann, and, and, and they had, and they were ready to go, and they got it all the way to the end, to the finish line, and then the Israelis cut the talks off. And you know, this had happened so many times and it continues to happen. It's like, it's just this power and this force of good comes all the way to the finish line and then something happens to make it fall apart. But um, yeah, they the, the women were definitely power brokers. They definitely wheeled and dealed. They definitely, you know, got this to happen. And, you know, I know a lot about this conflict, but I had no idea about either of these women. And so, um, I, you know, it's just, it's been, it's been fascinating to, to learn um, about these two power brokers in the shadows. Well, and we see soon how there's more disappointment and kind of heartbreak uh, up ahead. And Rabin is assassinated 
In November of 1995, at the age of 78, Ruth felt like peace and justice, which she had fought for her whole life, might finally be coming about. In 1992, Yitzhak Rabin, the first native-born prime minister of Israel, had been elected on a platform that embraced the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. As prime minister, he signed several historic agreements with the Palestinian leadership, including the Oslo Accords. He also signed a peace treaty with Jordan in 1994. That fateful night in November, Ruth watched from her home as a crowd of 300,000 gathered in Tel Aviv with the message of peace now. Rabin took the stage. An assassin, the son of a Yemenite kosher butcher, slipped through security backstage and fired bullets from a Beretta pistol. Rabin was on his back, bleeding to death. And within died a dream of many, a dream of peace. Quote, Ramonda never saw Arafat, an imperturbable veteran of many battles won and lost, more shaken than when the Shin Bet contacted him in his cramped presidential compound in Gaza to confirm the news reports. He must have understood intuitively that the bullets eliminated the best chance for the two peoples to come to terms. I am very sad and very shocked for this awful and terrible crime, he told the press, his lower lip trembling, his eyes watery and red, his face ashen. Quote, end quote. Dark days were ahead. So I was just kind of thankful, actually, that we were kind of given a glimpse into the humanity of this conflict um, that, you know, what you see in the news so often feels very kind of black and white and not necessarily nuanced. But I think throughout this whole story, this this relationship that Ruth and Ramonda had really just provided a lot more depth yeah, I agree. I I think that so many times there's no humanity to these stories, and um, Ruth and Raymonda brought that, I think, to the whole conflict. Um, but definitely to some of these major power brokers um, that that we otherwise have not heard. Heading back to war. Ramonda had left Ramallah for Paris after a car bomb and series of threats made it unsafe for her to remain. By the spring of 1997, she had arrived back in Ramallah. By the time Ruth celebrated her 80th birthday later that year, Hamas militant suicide bombers were blowing themselves up in markets and across Israel, with the only intention being to take as many Israelis as they could with them. In one attack, they killed 16 Israelis and injured 178 others. Each new attack brought new Israeli checkpoints along the borders of the territories. And although Israel had withdrawn from the large Palestinian cities and handed its central prison in Ramallah over to Arafat, Israel further restricted Palestinian movement and opened up fresh territory for the expansion of 140 Jewish colonies. And as the settlements expanded, so also grew the support for Hamas's message of violence. Arafat quickly lost ground. Quote, the stra stranglehold of checkpoints, the collapsing Palestinian economy where the best jobs were on construction sites for settlements, and the pervasive feeling that Oslo was a boondoggle, end quote, allowed Hamas to marginalize Arafat. And just as Arafat was being shouted down by more militant voices, Ruth was now seen, quote, to be little more than a crusty old has-been. Whatever pub public declaration she made sounded like whistling in the wind. End quote. It was Ruth's nephew, Usi, who was operating the iron necklace of control over the borders and the checkpoints. Quote, Instead of swinging her purse at him in righteous motherly anger, when Ruth ventured into the West Bank, she typically put on the peach pit necklace, maneuvering around checkpoints in her car, with soldiers following her through the scope of their rifles. Ignoring the security warnings of terrorist attacks, she continued working with Palestinian women, embroidering pillows to buy food for their families. As always, she preferred acting to grandstanding. If she wanted to see Ramonda, she headed to the West Bank because Ramonda hated using her Israeli-issued VIP card, for it smacked of an elitist arrangement between the Israeli military and what was now called the Palestinian Authority, a bankrupt oligarchy. Ruth often complained about the stranglehold on Gaza and the West Bank. She wasn't just channeling Ramonda when she w wared of an explosion if it continued. Oslo was supposed to bring peace, not a new intifada, end quote. So we see now Ruth and Ramonda kind of these aged women and it's almost like life is what it is and but the, it doesn't stop especially Ruth from wanting to 
still kind of be in the mix as she can and she continues to kind of take these risks and still travel even though there's this uh, increase in violence and security. Yeah, Ruth doesn't even seem to care about the checkpoints. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't, she's just not even phased. You know, Uzi's operating these checkpoints around Israel. And I mean, he's in control of them. And she basically is like, whatever, don't care. I'm going through them. You know, I mean, she's, it's just, it's incredible. Ruth meets Arafat, 1999. Quote, Ruth finally got her opportunity to meet Arafat face to face during a visit to Ramonda's daughter, Sua, in Gaza in 1999. An Israeli television crew was there to capture on film the widow of Diane ch chatting with the Palestinian first lady. Arafat entered the room and aimed straight for Ruth, who bolted up from the sofa in time to grab her, for him to grab her and give her a warm hug. He was so excited that he began kissing Ruth on one cheek, then the other. He repeated his kisses three times and told her how proud he was to have had her deceased husband as a foe. He was the best enemy a man could hope for, a real Bedouin warrior. The living quarry was singing the praises of the dead hunter. Ruth was wiping away tears. If Moshe were alive, he and Arafat would together make a peace of the brave." End quote. So kind of the respect that we've seen between Ruth and Ramonda, who were political enemies, but this true, these true sisters, it's, it's also seen here uh, and kind of Arafat voices it about him and his enemy, Moshi. Yeah, and it's kind of, it's almost this like respect, it's this love of, of old warriors, right? And it's this, it's the old way of fighting. It's this just, it, you don't see that anymore in a way, you know, and it's just, it's a way that um, even though, you know, they despised each other and, and what they stood for, um, there was still that, that deep rooted respect. Raimonda's power. By 2000, Ruth was one of the few Israelis Raimonda still saw, quote, unlike most Israelis, she ignored warnings that her gov by her government that the West Bank was a lawless and dangerous territory, a jungle. The specter of a, of the widow of the great general showing up on a Hamas website with duct tape wrapped around her face kept Shinbet people awake at night, end quote. Ramonda's daughter, Suha, had taken her own daughter to Paris due to health concerns. People who needed anything from Arafat, who spent most of his time in Ramallah, came to Ramonda. Ramonda simply ignored Arafat's advisors and spoke with him directly. He could never say no to his mother-in-law. So Ramonda still has this power and 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 she's um you know she's still there um in in ramallah with with arafat and her you know her daughters has already left paris but she's she, you know she's still there as a power broker when i was just imagining this elderly uh ramonda mother-in-law kind of role that she's playing and how she's kind of bending the ear of this world leader and in a way it's it's true that there's kind of no there's there's few things less persistent than kind of an elderly uh, figure in our lives who just can, you know, they, it's almost like they have nothing to lose. They just they they have a lot of wisdom to share. But uh, I I could just picture this um, exchange in my mind very well. Always the mother-in-law, isn't it? Always the mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> the Jordanian funeral. One night, Ruth showed up at Raimonda's house to a scene of chaos. The father of a large Christian family had just died, and his children wanted permission to travel to Jordan to attend the funeral, which was happening in just three hours. The relatives were already on the Jordanian side of the border waiting, but the Israelis would not allow the children to pass through. The problem is that the family included the founder of a militant organization and one of Arafat's most out outspoken foes. Although he would not be accompanying the family across to Jordan, his very existence and his place as number one on Israel's most wanted list made it impossible for the family to travel. Ruth sprang into action. Let me help, she suddenly announced in a loud enough voice that everyone stopped, their heads cocked in her direction. Just give me the names of your family members in Jordan and I'll see what you can do. If you go through Ruth's address book, you'll find the telephone numbers of the leadership elite in Israel. She picked up the house phone and called her nephew Uzi because he was the master gatekeeper. Uzi agreed to help Ruth. He would call ahead to the bridge and get permission for the family to pass. So again, you have another situation where Ruth the humanitarian Ruth springing into action, using her network, this massive Rolodex that she has to assist other people, um, to do good for other people. Um, you know, and, and, and in this case, again, there's Uzi, his, his gatekeeping, but it's Ruth and it's her heart and her love. 
the end of Arafat. As the Second Antifada began, the violence dramatically escalated. Ruth continued her humanitarian forays into the West Bank. Raimonda was still in Ramallah, walking over to the Mukata, the former prison, where Arafat had set up camp every day to visit him. Eventually, the IDF once again occupied the West Bank cities and laid siege to the Mukata in Ramallah. Days later, Ramonda heard over the military loudspeakers that, quote, in one hour, we are going to blow out the Mukata. Within minutes, a different set of loudspeakers belonging to mosques all over Ramallah instructed people to go to the streets to save their leader by defying the curfew and forming a human shield around the Mukata, end quote. Quote, Ramonda's cell phone was still working and she called Ruth. You must do something. Ruth, do you hear me? Are you there? Call this bloody Sharon of yours. He's going to kill Arafat. Call Uzi. For Christ's sake, do something. Ramonda, Ruth replies, what on earth do you imagine I can do? You think I can just call up Eric and order him to stop? Well, you can't just sit there. You must do something. Ruth, we're running out of time. Well, I have a surprise for you. I am not Eric Sharon. End quote. It was President George Bush, not Ruth, who yanked the leash on Sharon and kept Arafat alive that day. Arafat died in November 2004. So Ramonda and Ruth's unique communication style continued. Um, and again, for you know, Ramonda thinks Ruth is going to be able to make miracles, and Ruth is frustrated and tells Ramonda no, and yet you know, it's all this love and friendship and sisterhood coming through, you know, the the, the phone. Well, and in a way, it's kind of, you know, it almost is comical to hear it and this just this dialogue because, you know, but, you, you know, that the, they're not completely capable of controlling the situation. But I also heard kind of this desperation. It's kind of back to the, just this relationship is their, um, their kind of outlet to express and process with this still this conflict that is, per, you know, pervasive in their lives. The Walls. Ramonda II soon left Palestine, never to return. As a result of the four-year Second Antifada, Uzi created a security fence between Israel and the West Bank. Twenty feet high with watchtowers, the reinforced concrete barrier, quote, fit together like Lego pieces and separated family and friends, a Berlin Wall staking its way through the middle of the Holy Land, the Great Wall of Zion, end quote. Ramonda's theory on the wall is that it has less to do with security and more to do with preventing contact because contact leads to understanding. Ruth shared her sentiments, quote, if we want to be secure in this country, we'll have to tear them down. All the damn walls. End quote. So they both share this idea that security walls just don't build better neighbors. They create this inclusion and exclusion in, in this, this visual way. And, you know, they, these two women, they never have been about walls. Never. Um, and, you know, metaphorical walls and actual walls. And, you know, you, you read about this throughout the book, but they always are about about breaking them down, you know, through their conversations or, you know, R Ramonda calling Ruth and telling her to call somebody to come in and see the atrocities or Ruth and Ramonda being at the same hospital at the same time and, you know, breaking down that barrier. But um, this physical wall, I think both of them together lament what that means for the future of their land. Yeah, so often they were, you know, breaking down these walls that were between the two of them kind of head on and... But it's such a poignant observation, I think, that they've had and much more nuanced about these walls than the media would so much like us to have these kind of black and white uh, perceptions of these these scenarios and these situations and dilemmas. But it's really much more nuanced than that. The book. In the years that it took the author to write this book, he visited Ruth a hundred times in Tel Aviv and had flown off to see Ramonda five times in three different countries, quote. But we rarely discuss what they wanted out of the book, this book. They certainly couldn't expect a happy ending with Ramonda living in exile and Ruth shouting at the television each time the nightly news came on. Ruth is a proud founding member of an admirably successful state, a secular miracle most people in the world continue to see through the prism of the film Exodus, a story of overcoming all odds and rebuilding an ancient nation from the embers of the Holocaust. Ramonda, living in exile, belongs to a people still occupied and whose pre-1948 lands and cities remain well beyond reach of recovery. End quote. Quote, so Ruth, what do you want readers to take away from the book? Ask Ramonda. She's the one who puts us up to it. Let me tell you why I, I admire Ruth so much. It's because, like me, she's a product of the history of our country. She's full of contradictions. Who isn't in that place? But she's honest. She doesn't go around apologizing for what and who she is or pulling bones from archaeological digs to make a point. Most important for me is her compassion. She loves. Humanity could use more people like her. A few million more. 
The funny thing is that Ruth, word for word, offers the same vaulting praise for Ramona. That's what makes them friends. If Israel really wanted peace, the country would name streets after Ramonda and Ruth. The two would have their own TV talk show. Women, proponents and products of a dialogue, would be celebrated instead of ignored and exiled. So I guess the question is, did this book meet their goals? And I would say, I think it did. I think that these two women, if their story could be told, if their story could be known, I think it could create hope. I think that that region needs hope. I think that if people talked and walls would come down, I think that there would be hope for a future. And maybe the two state solution is the hope. Maybe there's another solution. Maybe there's something that no one's thought about. Who knows? But walls certainly don't help. Well, and this challenges each of us in our own lives to recognize what are those walls that were kind of uh, okay being there. And in a way, if they broke, we broke those walls down, what benefits there would be and what dialogue we could have and gain a better understanding. And I, I really left this, you know, after experiencing this story uh, with that. And it's such an incredible friendship and kind of a, just a, a, an example for all of us. And on that note, that's all we have for today. Thanks for listening to Ruth and Raymonda's story and sharing this experience with us. You can also interact with us, follow us, and learn about upcoming episodes on our website at modernathenas.com, our Facebook page under Modern Athenas, our Twitter at Modern Athenas, and our Instagram at the Modern Athenas Podcast. We would also appreciate if you support our podcast by leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher and subscribing to the podcast. In our next podcast, we'll be discussing the book Feminist Fight Club by Jessica Bennett. As we leave you today, we want to remind you to never forget that each of you, like all the modern Athenas we have discussed on the podcast, has the power and capacity to be a change maker in your world. Work hard, dream big, and reach for the stars.